Hi folks, let's make this set of gears. It's for a pretty fun shop project that hopefully is going to make life a little easier around here. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. We're using uh, our new product, the Saunders Machine Works Mod Vice or Modular Vice system. We like it because in this case, it's gonna let us hold these two parts and we're gonna do G54 and G55 work offsets. Card here, we're gonna go over how you do that in Fusion in a separate video to not force everybody to, to sit through that, but super cool. And they do two other key things. They hold our part up off the fixture plate with their built-in parallels so we can drill through the part and they hold on with a really low profile. So we're gonna be able to walk around the majority of the part in op one. First op, super fly to deck it off. Surface speed just under 2000 feet per minute. 8,007 inch feed. Next up, Sheer Hog. 785 surface feet per minute for surface speed. 10 thou feet per tooth, 0.2 inch optimal load, and 0.25 inch depth of cut. I was curious to see how the shear hog would hold up. We are spanning a four inch part with relatively thin material as we get through this, no problem at all. Likewise, no problem with the combination of car lane tiny vise and the mighty bite talon grips holding on. Half inch twist drill running at 300 surface feet per minute, 10 thou feed per revolution, pecking every eighth of an inch. This is purely to poke a clearance hole so that we don't have to plunge with our end mill. Cleaning up the face with a quarter inch end mill, about 6.3 millimeters. Then we're going to rough out that interior with an adaptive tool path. We'll make the Fusion 360 CAD available for this so you can download the cam and really poke through it in inches or metric on your own to get rid of that. But the important thing is I wanna leave just enough material, say 5,000 radial, so that we can come in, do a contour to clean it up because we want this to be a very light press fit for a bronze oil light bushing. Next, we're going to do a series of what I call progressive adaptives. I'm gonna use that same quarter inch tool 31 to remove as much of that material left after the shear hog. Then we're gonna come in with a 3 16th tool, just do a rest machining, and finally a 1 8 inch tool to rest it out from there before we finally do a 2D contour to get to our final geometry. So I have right clicked and protected each of these because at this point, we're not changing this CAD model. And every time I reopen or make some Feeds and speeds change up here. I don't want to regen. These small adaptives with rest machining take probably 40, 50 seconds to compute. It's a pain in the butt. So by protecting them, you avoid that. And if you saw our Fusion Friday 112 on how to get rid of those whisper cuts, that's the key to getting a really good clean rest machining where you don't have those whisper air cuts where it's bouncing all around, making tiny cuts that, that seem quite silly in our wasted machine motion.
I saw the machine doing this chamfer and look how jerky it is. This is terrible. I was kicking myself for not catching this. Take a look at our simulation. If we turn on show points, look at these black lines. These are all separate lines of, of G-code. Look at it as it rotates around that. This is going to cause, no matter what machine you have, a ton of unnecessary motion control movement and noise. So on the next one, I added smoothing. All I did was check a smoothing tolerance of one thousandth of an inch. Take a look at the what is effectively the lines of code uh, or number of points here. One, two, three, four, five, six versus hundreds. And look at the size of the code. The first one was 167 kilobytes. This one is literally like 16 times smaller. What a low hanging fruit type of improvement. So let's measure our bore. The CAD model was actually 0.747, and Ed has been doing a great job modeling up this project. I asked him, what do we want that fit to be? And he said, we really want it between 750 and maybe half a thou under it. Uh, the bearings were miking out to about 7505 or so, maybe 751. So we don't need much of a press fit. A thousandth of an inch should be plenty. So if you haven't used a telescoping gauge before, the way to use one is you compress the telescoping gauge tighten the end, put it into your bore at an angle, loosen it to let the two ends snap out to contact the inside bore at an angle, re-snug the end, don't tighten it, just snug it down, and then as you roll the telescoping gauge towards center, it will collapse the two telescoping bars until right when you meet the center line where the telescoping gauge is perpendicular to the bore, it'll all of a sudden go loose on you because you've now collapsed past the center point and the telescoping bars have reached the smallest they're going to get. And then you lift it out and it's a transfer measurement tool. So you can definitely measure thousandths of an inch, maybe even tighter. Uh, generally, it's not the right tool though for things like ten thousandths of an inch. Grab our quantum mic. I love this thing because it's so much faster to use. And sure enough, we're just a few tenths under the diameter that we had in our CAD, which is great. Now, I love using gauge pins. We were fortunate enough to find some over the years at various auctions uh, or buy diameter specific ones. They're not that expensive individually. This is a 746. It goes, it's tight, but it goes. And the 747 does not. So that tells me we're using our telescoping gauge pretty well. So I just put 0.2741 in as the tool diameter. How did we get to that map? Well, we're using cutter comp coming back to last week's Wednesday widget. We know we want our bore to be about half a thou or about 0.012 millimeters under 0.75 inches. If our current bore that we're measuring is, is about 0.7466, that means we need to change our tool diameter by that amount. And if our tool diameter was currently 0.25, we're going to back out that change and we're going to enter 0.2471 and use cutter comp to avoid having to go back to cam to make that change. Remeasure our bore. Look at that. Awesome.
So we're walking around the outside of this part a little lower than the part itself. Any idea why? I had a thought. Let's hit pause. We've got to flip this part over to do an op two to machine the chamfer on the back side. How do we do that? How do we clock this part? There are a couple of interesting creative ways to do it, but I, I wanted to do it the easiest way possible. It's something I've been wanting to try is backside chamfering. We actually use this tool to make the parallels for the SMW mod vise in one op. It lets us put chamfers on both sides without having to do that second op. So I know we can do it. I haven't had a lot of experience with it. Let's give it a shot. So my thought was we're going to use our 3 16 end mill to lower down this profile around the part. That way we've got enough room for a back chamfer tool. It's not plunging into solid material and having some clearance below the tool should help with chip clearance, especially as we start diving into pretty pre precarious situations. And probably, this is probably not ideal. Right here, we're contacting the tool in two different spots. You can hear there, I had a little bit of chirp. The cut quality was, was quite good and it didn't bother me and it didn't seem like the tool was going to break. Now, we're gonna do a separate video on this because I think it deserves one. I think it's a pretty cool process. For those that are wondering though, we were running this at 288 surface feet. That's 88 meters a minute. We actually backed that RPM down with feed rate override, I think down about 10 or 20% low. And we were taking a very light chip load per tooth, seven tenths of a thou, about 0.018 millimeters. Again, just to take it easy as we're learning. And then finally, I thought, well, we need to flip this part over because we've got the old, we've got the hat top. We've got all this extra material that we're using for work holding to get rid of. But we'd have to machine all that material away. We couldn't just deck it with a superfly because we all know what happens when you try to superfly off unsupported material. So I thought, let's try tabbing it out. This is so cool. I was super conservative with multiple step downs, but all you've got to do infusion to tab is a 2d contour go into the geometry tab check tabs i set tab position to be at points and i picked four points and you can see it's adding those tabs and look at your toolpath it automatically adjusts for the height of the tab and the width of the tab that you want and watch look these tabs are 3 16ths or under five millimeters wide and only 50 thou tall. They're so fragile that we could, we're could we gonna be able to break them away when we're done, but they do the trick, they hold the part. Now, one of the tricks we've learned when you're tabbing is under passes, aside from the multiple depths, we're leaving 10 thou radial stock. So at no point is that tool shank ever touching the workpiece, and that's gonna help you avoid any chatter or surface problems with the part that's already done. We wanna get the material off below it. I don't, again, wanna to touch that part and have it bounce back and forth because the part is not nearly as rigid as it was, especially as we start getting down to the bottom of this. Ignore all these errors. That's just because I haven't simulated from the beginning. Here we go. but it worked, which is so cool. I'm carefully holding my hand in here. Be safe if you do this, but you can get a feel if the part is chattering too much, you'll have an idea, but it was very solid here. It's so cool. So we couldn't quite break it off by hand and I didn't, didn't want to damage the part either, but a quick snip uh, with our pliers with one or two lets you then bend the rest out. 
We still have a little bit of material though on the back side of the actual gear that we've got to get off. So we could use a set of soft jaws, and we actually keep uh, soft jaws in various diameters labeled and marked in our soft jaw drawer. So I had a set of inch and a half, so they would work. But there's actually a better way, and I hate to say it, but it involves a lathe and one of the coolest tools out there, which is expanding ID mandrels. You can make these yourself. We got our set at a, at a garage sale for 10 bucks. This is a great use here because there's going to be a super secure way uh, to hold this part and give me full access to that backside. The other nice thing is, joking aside about my love or, or disdain for lathes, the cam is so easy. We have a lathe template that we keep, which has all of our preferences and tooling ready to go. So literally, it's like two clicks, and we get this facing off that's going to walk down the face and clean up that backside. end up with something off on the overall width with regard to the backside chamfer and I'm going to leave it at that. We're going to go get smart on that uh, before we even try to profess any knowledge but I know we're going to get that figured out and I want to give you guys uh, uh, the recipe, the fusion settings, the tool settings so that we can run backside chamfers safely, reliably and accurately. We were off an odd amount here. It was like maybe 10th hour so could have also been operator error uh, upstream, but I don't think it was. Uh, we made a mistake somewhere, but anyways, more to come on that and more to come on this project. The project is to open these rubber doors. I'm tired of walking through them. We need them to help isolate the shop in the office, but I need to walk through and we walk through a lot. So we wanted a really fast way to open them up when somebody's right in front of them. So stick around. We'll build the rest of that next week. Hope you learned something. Hope you enjoy, folks. Take care. See you next Wednesday.